think this is gonna work. There he is. <laughs> oh my gosh, dude. Yeah, the Instagram <laughs> Live. You can, you know, I can do Rubik's cubes and things like that. But you try to get on an Instagram Live. Heavens to Betsy. Great <laughs> seeing you. Nice. How's it going, Tom? Tom's a Tom's an old friend. He's in. You're in Jackson, New Hampshire, in the White Mountains. Yep, in the White Mountains of New Hampshire, lovely nice. Nice. Mount Washington Valley, which drew me here probably 32 years ago, and my heart and soul have been here ever since, even though it's good to be able to travel. I think as much as I love the mountains here, as you know, man, you can fall in love with where you live, but there's always that pull of the mountains far and away. So, but yeah, good, good to, to see, see you. you. I feel like I should be interviewing you. Tom's a Tom's an old school legend um, of the climbing community, and he was with us um, as the main ideator on on the Everest trip a few years ago. And he was the last person to see Mallory's body um, mm -hmm. when when Conrad and, and Jake found it on the north side of Everest. So looking into a um, 60 how, how many year old corpse was that? he had been there for 75 years so when we discovered the body he had been missing for 75 years let me just try to get my phone in a cozy little spot yeah he had been he, he george mallory and sandy irvin went uh on a summit attempt on june 8th in 1924 and uh, that's a long time ago to be over 28,000 feet. That was before most people thought it was possible to even get to that height without dying. And uh, they disappeared. Last seen actually headed in the direction of the summit, which is pretty amazing and uh, th that they were that high. But, but after they went into the clouds, that was it. They were gone. And so... You know, for many, many years, people wondered, not only people who are fans of mountain climbing and things like that, but, but family. You know, he, he left three children behind. Sandy Irvin's parents were obviously heartbroken. And uh, 75 years later, there we were with a public broadcasting crew and a BBC crew with a, it, you know, I had been, you know, training regionally all my life for mountain climbing. And then suddenly I was on the Olympics, right, with Conrad Anker and, you know, Jake Norton and, and yeah, Andy yeah. Politz. It was really like just being thrown into this world class team. And uh, on the first day of searching, May 1st, 1999, Conrad, rebel without a cause, if you will, goes out of the search area. He's like, ah, you know, so he kind of ventures out following, I guess, a little bit of gut and and uh, and sits down to take a look around. And there, not too far off, was George Mallory. And so, you know, many who follow this at all are, are well aware that, you know, that that was one of the most historic modern day expeditions. And it wasn't about a summit. It was about trying to shed light on whether Mallory and Irvin were indeed the first people to make the summit. Um, we never found out. And as Renan well knows, you know, we, you know, 20 years go by, you know, and there's still no answer, despite the fact that we found you know, Conrad and the team found found uh, Mallory's body. There's no proven evidence that he made it. And and even though my gut intuition tells me that he probably didn't, there's no saying that he didn't. Like, who knows? Like, we can't say he did, but we can't say he didn't. So it's all about the realm of human possibility. Like, how... How far can an individual go when he or she truly sets, you know, their heart and soul into a task? And, uh, you know, Renan, yourself, who was a person who, you know, kind of, you know, always knew about Everest, right? But you set your, your heart and soul on other things, you know, maybe more vertical or, or on, on mountains that nobody even knows the names of, you know, until you went there. Nobody knew what Meru was. I did because I had been there before, but um, then, uh, you know, Mark Sinnott 
gives you a ping and he's like, hey, Pollard thinks he knows where Sandy Irvin is. And and suddenly you're interested. And, uh, oh, you, all hell broke loose, dude, when you got onto the team that, that, you know, suddenly Mark and I were like, we'll go. We'll pay our own way. We'll do a, you know, grassroots climbing expedition. And then you got involved and it was like, hey, if we're going to do this, let's do a film. Let's get real financing. Let's do this right and, you know, as a little bit of a backstory, um, not long before that, somebody had gone missing on Broad Peak, which is uh, one of the 8,000 meter peaks near K2. And uh, a drone operator, the brother of the guy who disappeared, took a drone and flew it darn near up to the summit of Broad Peak and found his brother still alive. And they were able to rescue him because of the drone. And so suddenly, instead of going to Mount Everest and putting our boots on the ground, which it sounds all well and good, but you put your boots on the ground, you're risking life and limb. You know, Everest is easy, right? We've all heard it. You're clipped into a rope. It's a walk up. You know, we'll leave the altitude for the nutrition part when we talk about that in a few minutes. But but when you're off rope, even though it's like, you know, maybe 40 or 45 degrees, if you slip and fall, you you just keep going. It's over. It's a, you know, if you were on a roof and at a 10 foot drop, big deal. But but it's every step is life and death. So if we could get a drone up there and this is Renan's, you know, the, the force of your character, if we can figure out how to get dr drones up there. We can do vast amounts of searching that no human beings could ever do in years. And so that's what we set about to do, to get up there and use the drones. And, you know, Renan, that's, it was just absolutely brilliant what you did. And the, and the images that, that we spent most of our time searching, you know, from the comfort of a, of a little hotel in, in Tibet, looking at pictures and blowing them up and looking for evidence of Mallory or Irvin. Pretty, pretty amazing, like a real remarkable, you know, tr it's the first of, of its kind of expedition. And, you know, Mark and I would have gone and had a great time. But but without you, my man, like you really made the difference. You put us on the map in a big way. No, it's just, it was, yeah, it's a big, it's a big team effort on a, on a trip like that. It comes down to a lot of, a lot of details. Yeah, this is. This is just a general chat about about creativity and high altitude nutrition and our, our trip to Choma Longma, um, that, which is the native indigenous Tibetan uh, name for, for Everest. Um, yeah, and, and Tom was was a key key part part of that that trip, and yeah, so we're just we're just chatting about that. Uh, we. Like Tom was saying, we use drones to search. I didn't really do anything too crazy. Um, <laughs> it's just hard to hard to operate in general up there, and putting yourself in the position with the, with a camera or a drone that even has a, has battery life, and if you feel good enough to even like sit up and and press the button, is it felt like a big accomplishment, and. Uh, yeah, it was it was pretty wild. Those things flew basically stock um, out of the manufacturer. We just got a special permission to unlock the altitude and uh, hack the descent speed so we could get them down faster. Um, but it was it was exciting to to have something that we had dreamed about and um, you and Mark had thought about actually come come to life and. Yeah. Well, that that might make a good segue to talk about altitude nutrition because operating a drone at at a altitude is almost impossible, but the idea of operating a human body is is another thing. And uh so we were fortunate enough to have good to go foods with us and that was uh you know, that was through Renan, really, like a contact of yours, even though Good To Go Foods is, you know, kind of a, a stone's throw from where I live at their home base. But it made a lot of difference because probably one of the biggest challenges on a climbing expedition is 
is staying healthy and, and, and motivated, you know, and one of the things that goes away at altitude is a good appetite or the desire to, you know, even drink, uh, you know, water. And, and so, you know, with, with a, with a partner like good to go foods, they were able to supply us with good high altitude fare. And admittedly my favorite high altitude food until 2019 was, uh, Snickers bars and, and ramen because, it, oh, and coffee, of course, you know, I mean, I'm a big coffee guy and I know you're not supposed to drink coffee at altitude, but, uh, it, it this was kind of a game changer for us. And, um, what did, do you feel that way as well? I mean, we really had some good food up high. Yeah, no, it's, I, I mean, it's, it's hard to eat anything in the way that, I, I describe a lot of those trips to to people um, is that as soon as you arrive at base camp, your body starts to die and, you, and the hourglass is, is ticking because you're at 18,000 mm -hmm. feet and you start to decline. And it's this careful balance of how you manage your energy. If you start chasing yaks too hard, try to get beauty shots and, and base camp down <laughs> low, you might not ever make it up high and mm -hmm. yeah the food is is pretty pretty important you can't really digest much and everything makes you feel nauseous so yeah i i've never had a problem with with the good to go so i just kept that because our buddy uh freddie first first connected me with justin and the, and the team over there and We've had them on family backpacking trips and the Ruth Gorge, lower altitude expeditions, all kinds of like lightweight trips. But this was, that was my first time um, at altitude. And yeah, it, I think it's, I mean, it just goes to show that like it's simple is best. You read the ingredients on there and it's, there's no yellow seven or, or green five. It's just, carrots <laughs> peas <laughs> and yeah. and things that you, you've heard of before but uh but yeah i think uh we had we had all their problems in terms of i mean if you if you've seen some of the some of the media coming out and red mark's book the third poll that just came out it goes really deep into all this and the issues that we were facing but we we were battling even to melt water for the, for the food that we did have. And mm -hmm. as we started to get, yeah, Todd Taylor's dad, yeah, we had good to go in the wind rivers with, with Todd. Um, but yeah, we were barely eating anything up high. So to be, to be honest, like a lot of us didn't need anything on the, on the final 30, 40 hour summit push. And then, as you come down, you start to eat things that you can, you can, your body can deal with. Um, I really love the granola of the good to go, which is like, you don't even have to, you don't even have to put hot water or anything into it. You yep. can, you can eat it as it is and it's, it's packaged. And we had good to go in the jungle for this last, um, Tapui expedition, um, again with Mark and Honald and, and Taylor. And that was, uh, a trip where all food just rots and is destroyed in a few days if it's not packed really really um like sealed like like these guys and it's it's always a matter of space and weight and that's another thing with, with altitude is you gotta everything has to be light hence the, mm -hmm. the dehydrated nature of it um but yeah, yeah calorie-rich, low salt. You know, like I'd said ramen earlier, ramen is like eating, like pouring salt into your mouth. And it and it has that brothy taste, in which I liked. So it was kind of like drinking your food. But uh, it, it was good, nutritious food. And, it, and as you said, when you're on a summit push, like eating is, it's secondary. You don't really need to eat to survive up there. But a little bit of hydration and laying the groundwork for that summit push is critical. And that all happens at what you eat, you know, kind of at the first high camp. And then as you move your way up. Yeah. Yeah. I, 
I from from Corey Richards, I got the tip to put the camel black uh, your water bladder. I think I actually had an MSR inside the suit and mm. I had the hose. Everything was inside and I was sipping off that. Um, it did eventually freeze, but that was kind of a little secret weapon to get a tiny bit of hydration in um, just because. Yeah, I know. I know Mark didn't eat much. He was having some issues and uh, yeah. <laughs> You just kind of do do what you can, but well, it's it, it's also really simple, and and you know, obviously, you know, good to go kind of got got us started today, and I want to send them all the love that they deserve. One of the best parts at altitude, the last thing you want to do is toil away at a at a, at a cook stove. I mean, it's it's it, it, one you you don't want to go outside of your tent even, and if you're cooking, there's the fumes from from your stove, so you just pour water into it boiling water and and that hits the spot so it makes it really easy and that that's it it's like you don't want to take your hands or your toes out of a sleeping bag well you do because you're the drone master right so you'd be sitting and we'd be resting quietly at the north coal and all of a sudden i'd hear and and the drone lights up and everybody's like oh there goes renan again and off you'd go and everybody would kind of run out and watch what you were filming on the drone. And so, uh, dude, you are a man with limitless energy. Uh, I honestly think that there is something not human about your ability to just wake up 24 seven, get up out of your tent, whether it's checking a time-lapse camera or getting another drone shot or it, it really does boggle the mind because I think sometimes once time, you know, people get in their tent warm and toasty, it's really tough to extract yourself from it. But I think it for my knowing you the way I do, which isn't extensively, we met maybe 10 years ago up in Jackson with Freddie and um, you have this burning desire to create and it and and you are just feeding this 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 voracious appetite to just try to get one better shot or another shot that maybe you've never seen before and and i love that and i'm inspired by it and uh you know can, do, do you, is there words to it or do you have you ever tried to articulate what that is in you that that drives you to create all the time? Oof, yeah, throwing out the big <laughs> questions. Um, no, I don't know. I think it's it's just uh, a lot of it comes from just the privilege to be in those places and you know um, how special it is and you know how limited your time is um, just in general on this earth. Yeah. So you just want to go go really hard and um, I think we're living at this incredible inflection point of the technology um, where it's smaller and you can get it into a lot of those places and um, especially after this last year um, like people are listening to the, to the right kind of stories and and we're just trying to yeah like really make make the most of it and yeah, sometimes it gets, it does get stressful with all those different tools and opportunities <laughs> and, and things. Yeah, I, yeah, I think um, the, the one, the first shot of our, of that Everest expedition, at least, and I know that it happens on the other ones as well, is uh, just the amount of gear that you take to the airport. And um, you don't have to have all that gear to be creative. But it sure doesn't hurt when you want to make pictures that are going to knock people's socks off. And um, Renan, you've you've been since 2019. You've been on some remarkable expeditions to the Arctic, down to Guyana, to the jungle. And um, you know what? You know, is there something you're after? You know, like I I mean that kind of truly like. Like, what is it you're you want to discover on these expeditions and other than making beautiful pictures 
and I think I kind of know the answer because I know you love to connect with individuals and people, but, and the land and the environment, but, but what are, what are you trying to share with the world? Like if, if somebody couldn't see your work, what is it you're trying to do for give back to us or to the planet? Um, yeah. Um, I mean, it used to be more of just showing these environments in a way that people haven't seen before, but, but obviously there's, there's a bigger goal these days in conservation and, and social justice. And, and those are like huge, um, crazy, crazy topics. But I think the more you can boil it down to individual connection and bring all these art forms and people together on a film project like we had on Everest, where you're, you're tying things in on a really personal level, then, then it might make people turn their heads in a different way um, rather than just a news headline. And yeah, and sometimes those pieces of media like cut through the, the fat of everything else and, and do make a difference. So mm -hmm. yeah, that's, I think that's, that's part of it. Um, and sometimes mm -hmm. it's, it's worth waiting 10 to 20 years for a single project to come, come to life. Like, um, like the project that you're also a part of, um, the Sancti of Space, which, which is telling the story of, of Brad Washburn, one of the greatest mountain aerial photographers and explorers to, to ever, to ever live. That's connecting mm -hmm. on, on like a deep personal level with, with the subject and, and letting it come to fruition over, over many years. <clears throat> and, uh, yeah, sometimes those things, um, never happen, but you're, you're fighting for them in, in the background and, um, and trying to, trying to make it work day, day by day with, with all the other opportunities that, that come through. And it's been, it's just been really fun to collaborate with, with so many different people. Cause I, I would love to do more, more painting and artwork for myself personally. It's like really, uh, it's, it's relaxing and, and nice, but now I've gotten into this, <clears throat> video world and and film stuff honestly it's it's stressful and i feel like it's it's just like killing me slowly but it's also like inspiring and um i, I have like a lot of energy for it to mm. to hopefully like apply all of this like this little, these little bits of like technology that we can get our hands on to these these stories now that are beyond beyond climbing that that mm. uh put the put it in the hands of people and the voices of people that need to be amplified and i know that's yeah. said a lot but it's it's, but it's true for us yeah you know um you actually said something in there that's that's really heavy um but you said, you know, like kind of it's you're so busy and trying to get it all in that it's slowly kind of killing you. Right. I, I don't I, I think sometimes there's a literal sense to that. But but you have this unique ability to have an idea and make it become reality. I mean, if it, one just needs to look at that, the painting on the back wall behind you to see that you were seated in front of, I believe that's the Trango group that in Pakistan behind you, you looked at it and made it happen. It's a different kind of media medium there because you're just relaxing and painting and there's no hours of the day, but it's almost like, you know, that some people are kind of chosen, like you have these abilities and, and you're like, well, I'm going to hang on for the ride and I'm going to try to get every single thing out of it that I possibly can. And then let's hope, but when, you know, you're, you're a young man now, let's hope by the time you're, you know, 60, let's say you'd be like, all right, I'm pulling back. Well, let's, you need to make it to 60. So you need to have a painting expedition, but, but it's like, you are a voice for, for people, for the concerns of people, for the environment, for, for cultures. And. I, 
I would never want to place that on you and say, well, if you don't do it, you're not doing your job because you, uh, your job is to stay healthy. You're, you, you have a beautiful wife and, and family, extended family, and a lot of people who care about you. But, but um, you have these ideas, and it's like I can come almost picture like seeing your brain working while you sleep, like just these dreams churning things out and you wake up and okay dreams will become reality now boom and there's not enough brad washburn used to say there are not enough hours in the day to do the things that i want to do and brad lived till he was 96 and that ain't bad yeah <laughs> yeah he was if you haven't if you haven't seen brad washburn's work um just look it up and Hopefully, um, our our film that's coming out sometime it's it's done. That sanctity space film is just slowed down release with with COVID because we always thought it would mm -hmm. be a theatrical thing and theaters are all theaters are all down. But yeah, I'm still, um, you know, I'm still up until you know midnight one in the morning, um, almost every night, like working, like pressing the buttons, and I think that. Although I've been in some horrific accidents um, and I push myself to the brink on expeditions, what a lot of people don't see is, um, mm -hmm. and it's probably the same for you, is when you're, how, put, how hard you push yourself when you're home and behind, behind the, the computers, like um, climbing the pixel mountain, <laughs> so to speak. And uh, right. that, that's what really kills you not slowly, but quickly, it, like it destroys your, yeah. your body, like that much editing, but it's also like really important to take that time to, to really go through the data. It's kind of like shooting a Nat Geo expedition and being your own editor. When you deliver stills to Nat Geo, they even like a misfire when you, when you shoot the ground, you have to deliver every single raw image that you shot. And um, that's, that's really a, a naked feeling, but when you get back and you really spend the time to look through it, that's where you discover beauty in the unexpected. And um, if I had a like an overall motto, and that's like come come out of the woodwork. I think that that's it. Because if you stay curious and you're always looking for unexpected beauty, then that that's what keeps you going and and keeps you curious and and makes it so you don't just give up whether it's in the field when you're hypoxic on Everest or sitting in front of the, the computer screen and you, it's just crashed four different times and you're all you're trying to do is process a time lapse. <laughs> um, so as we kind of turn that was beautiful and thank you. Um, so as we kind of turn the corner a little bit um, and and don't want to keep people too long. Um, do you have any uh, exciting projects that we should keep our eyes open or anything planned that you can share uh, to let people know what you might be embarking upon soon? Um, I mean, definitely the sanctity of space, which, which you, know, you know, if you guys don't know, Tom was like one of Brad Washburn's Proteges, and they had a tight relationship, and a lot of Tom's footage is in this this feature doc that that's coming out, um, and it feels so old now because we've been working on it for for over ten years. But that'll that'll eventually drop. But Taylor and I just looked at our list, and we literally have fourteen um, different docs in development, and almost none of them have to do with climbing. They're all uh, mainly conservation and and social justice type type films. Um, even though I am I'm supposed to go with um, my friend John Griffith, who's a, like become this master of virtual reality VR shooting, and mm. and Honold um, to go and and do some. Honold wants to you know push the limits with soloing even more. <laughs> Mm. somehow and uh <laughs> and oh, go figure capture yeah. that in like VR. but yeah that'll be fun we're gonna be we're gonna be um in like the high alps shooting shooting vr later this summer and that'll be just like kind of back to the climbing roots and it's 
it's always full on climbing with uh climbing with hodl in those environments and like puts puts me back on my my toes and makes me train hard and fear for fear for my life and all that good stuff <laughs> keeps you human um but yeah um you know but you know ben Ayers as well yeah. um He's uh, he's out in the Dolpo region in Nepal right now, um, and we've been we've been pitching the snow leopard conservation project. I was talking about it earlier, mm -hmm. but definitely excited about that. We just finished like this full pitch teaser for that, nice. which is a big big effort and like you know decks and budgets, and we're trying to get mm -hmm. that that off the off the ground. But yeah, um, yeah, lots of yeah. stuff in the air. And we're building um, a studio. Because <laughs> so, you don't have enough to do, right? Uh, yeah. yeah, but that yeah. but that will be your, you'll have an official home base. Um, hey, bef Renan, there's a question here. Um, Kate asks, uh, what's the best way to get involved in producing climate change films? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm lucky because like Taylor's been you know, she has her master's degree in this kind of stuff, has been studying it forever. And, and I kind of use her as a point of reference as to what what to get involved in and what not to get involved in. But I think I would give the same advice as I would give to anyone um, when they're asking like, how do I find a story, this and that. And what I normally say is that just look close to home and things that you might not expect. It's it's what you have the most intimate emotional access to. Sometimes it's within your own family. And that's the story that's really gonna be heartfelt. And, and that, that kind of honesty comes out on screen. You can't just have a fancy camera anymore. And with climate change, it's maybe it's the same kind of thing where you're you're looking for your personal connection to it or something that's close to home for you that you have an inside track on and you're taking this massive, massive issue and world of storytelling and distilling it down to something really intimate and emotional because mm -hmm. taking on the big picture is, is really hard and you gotta <laughs> sometimes um, find your lane. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not, and we're not always great at that. We we're not like, um, you know, we were really inspired by like friends like Paul and Christina Nicklin and um, mm -hmm. a lot of people who, who have developed their, their nonprofits and their organizations that tackle specific issues. And mm -hmm. we're trending towards doing that in the desert Southwest and some of these native communities, but overall we're we're more generalists and um maybe I, we need to take our own take my own advice on that too but yeah i think sometimes we tend to look like how am i going to make it big in this business and do the do the right thing about climate change and it's happening right here like well right where we all are and i think sometimes those personal stories that we know the most about are the ones that we can tell the best. So it's great starting point. Yeah. And, it, and it's like, you know, if you, to conjure up, you know, you were talking about Alex Honnold and, you know, Mark Sinnott and wrote the book, you know, The Impossible Climb. It, it, Mark wrote his first book, or his first big book, not guidebook, about something he knew intimately. And, and that helped him a lot. And then part of that book, half of it really was his own story. And it's beautiful. And, and so I think that's, then you get to venture forth and you don't need, you know, 20 suitcases of equipment to do it. You, and you don't even need a really expensive camera. Heck, you've shot some beautiful things on your iPhone for that gorgeous things on your iPhone. And so, yeah, per, perhaps maybe that's it. Maybe we look to, some of us look too far off in the distance for the great thing that's going to bring us to the chosen land <laughs> right. yeah 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 i think community focused things like trying to trying to get involved there is, is pretty important from like mm. food perspective from travel perspective um yeah it's 
it's not it's not easy but that climate change is is the biggest biggest thing to tackle and it's it's bigger than it's bigger than climbing and if we can if we can use climbing and all these things that that people pay attention to 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 be a gateway <laughs> to create more yeah. understanding of all this other stuff then that's that's great right. Awesome. Well, thank you. I don't want to keep you for too long. Actually, you invited me into your house and I'm truly honored. We we spent two months together two years ago and we now occasionally get to text and chat on the phone. And I always look forward to that. To actually see you virtually is beautiful. And I look forward to once we all get uh, all our everybody's vaccine vaccinated. I'll come on out. Maybe Sinnet and I will get in the car and take a road trip at when you open up your expedition studios. And um, yeah, keep us posted. And and the 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 good to go um, you know thing is something that I hope people who are watching who live this kind of lifestyle will truly look into. It's worth it. It's uh it's it's easy food. Good healthy carbohydrates, low salt, and tasty as hell. It's not boring camp food that, you know, it, it's it's the real deal. And um, so I'm thankful to them for helping make me feel good on Mount Everest and camping trips. And, uh, you know, so so to you as well, thank you for your creativity, your love, your your true passion to try to inspire people. And that's that's the beauty of Renan and and Taylor, your your incredibly talented wife, and inspiring others to take action and not just sit back and think all is lost. Awesome, well said, Tom. Um, oh, there's, still, well. there's still pretty, there's still pretty heavy questions coming in. Yeah, you want to answer? I'll stick around. Oh, man. Have you ever had feedback that made you realize the impact your film had? I'm sure you've had lots of feedback. Yeah, I mean, yes and no. Um, I mean, you've had, yeah, sometimes like people watch films that have like dedicated their lives to, to issues because of it. That's mm. that feels like feels like real impact. Um, yeah, lately we've been, you know, every film yeah. kind of has its nonprofit related to it and. Um, go fund me like for Vladimir um, Russian marine mammal biologist um, like with Taylor's dad went with on impact on Winford's life who just passed away from ashes to ashes film it's hard to say like the, the true impact there but um, sharing his his story before he passed and hopefully mm. like he's like he says like you can't can't change the world but put a dent in it um <laughs> yeah and yeah it's it's a tricky uh tricky way to way to go but uh indeed anyways yeah I, we'll we'll have to we'll we'll have to continue this thing um again maybe we can have another one of these these little chats and realize like how many good questions would, would come out of it so thanks everybody for for tuning in.